Hello, this is Dr. Joe Trout from the Physics Program at the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey. This is Linux for Scientists and Engineers, and this lecture is on file permissions and security. In Linux and Unix, there's three entities when considering file permissions and security. Read, write, and execute permissions are granted according to these three entities. First we have the user. The user is the one who created or copied the file. Users are listed in the Etsy password file and normally their passwords are encrypted in the Etsy shadow file. Here's an example of the password and the shadow file. And in the first column are listed the users' names, such as the super user root. Each user also has a number associated with his username and this number is unique on the system and it's known as the UID. Users may be added to the system using the add user utility or the admin GUI. If you have a lot of users to add, you might want to use the add user utility. But if you only have one or two users to add at a time, it's probably easier and more efficient to use the GUI itself. So the user add utility creates a new user or updates default new user information. Here's the options. You can do things like define the user's home directory or you can create the user's UID The reason you might want to do this is because you may have a user with accounts on several different servers. And on each one of those servers you'd want them to have the same UID number so that when he's copying files back and forth the username remains the same and the user ID remains the same. But as I said, it's probably easier to use the GUI if you're just going to add one or two users at a time. This has to be done as root. And in Red Hat Linux, the GUI is user bin system config users. Even though the password and the shadow file are actually text files and you can add edit them easily, you probably don't want to do that. You probably want to go through the GUI. Once you click on the add user button, it's going to ask for a username you can put the full user's name, then a password, then ask it to confirm the password, then the user's home directory, 
and the login shell. For users home directory and the login shell defaults will come up. We'll talk more about the shell later. For now, if you're adding users, bash is a good shell to use. You also have to give the user a group to be a member of. The default is for when you create a user is for a group to be created that has this, the user's username as the group name. So each person is in their own group. Here you see there's created a group called FAA and if we click on that then our new user will be a, a member of the group FAA. So once again when you go to add a new user you can put in the username you can put in the full name, the password, and the login shell. You can cl click create a new directory for the, for the user's home directory. And you can do things like create a private group for the user. Once again, that's what, what this will do is say I add a user Joe. When I add that user Joe, they will also add a group named Joe. And the user Joe will be a member of the group Joe. Which brings us to the second entity when we're talking about security, and that's the group. As the name suggests, a group is a collection of select users. A group is added but to the system by the system administrator using a GUI or the group add utility. The GUI is, pretty, is very simple. It just asks for a group name and then you could specify the GID or the group ID manually. Once again if you have several servers in your research group you might have wanted to have the same sets of groups so you might want to specify the group ID manually so that it's the same on every system. The group add utility is also easy to use. You can just type group add in the username. And once again there's an option dash G so you can type in your own GID. The GID is an integer and each group must have a unique GID or group ID. The reason for groups are simple. Let's say you have a file and you want to be able to read and write to it but you want a bunch of other people just to be able to read it. You don't want them to change your file. And then there's other people in the system that you don't want to be able to even read it. So what we can do is create a group. For instance, let's call a group 
FAA and that's all the people working on a project supported by the FAA and if I create a file I can give myself read and write access and to the rest of the group I'll give just read access and to everybody not in our group I won't give them any access at all. I won't give them read or write access. A user may belong to one more than one group, but every user has to have a primary group. When a user creates a file, the user's name and group are attached to that file. And by default, the group name given to that assigned to that file is the primary one. Once again you can add groups to the user or add users to the group by using the GUI. If you double click on the user a list of available groups will appear and you can indicate which groups you want this user to belong to. Once you've selected the, the groups that you want them to belong to, you can go ahead and select the primary group. So this is a drop-down menu which will include the available groups. In this example, this user belongs to both group, group FAA and Group Joe. I'm going to have Group Joe be the primary group. Two helpful utilities are the groups utility which will tell you what groups a user belongs to and the ID utility. So for instance if I do a who am I my username appears and it's Joe Trout. If I do an echo dollar sign user all in capital letters this is a shell variable and it contains my username. This will be helpful when you're writing scripts later. If I look at my groups, I'm a member of the Joe Trout group, the root group, the bin group, the daemon group, the sys, admin, disk, wheel, and FAA groups. The ID utility will print out my username along with my UID, my user identification. It will also print out the groups I belong to. The first one is the primary one and it shows the group ID. In this case it's 500 and my primary group is Joe Trout. After the groups are listed you'll see a line that says context dash unconfined and some other things. By the way you can use ID on a different user and it will show you the user ID and the groups that the other user belongs to.
By the way, when you're doing a listing, a long listing of files, if you do an ls-n, it will print the user and group numbers instead of the user and group name. So it'll print out the UID and GID instead of the actual names of the groups and the users. So for example, if I do an ls-l on a file called file1.txt, I see the permissions are listed first, then the owner of the file, Joe, and then his primary, instead of Joe being written, Joe's UID is listed, and that's 65539. Instead of the group FAA being listed, 65541 is written. So the first one is the UID of the user, and the second one is the GID of the file. When you copy a file from one computer to another, it's actually the UID, so the user ID number, and the GID, the group ID number, that's carried along with the file. This can possibly create some problems. If I have server A, and I create a file and I copy it over to server B. If the group ID is 500 for FAA in one computer and I go to server B and FAA has a different group ID then either the group name will be undefined or it will be wrong. So if you have a bunch of computers in your research group you might want to make sure that the user IDs and the group IDs are consistent across all the servers. At some point, you'll learn about things like Network Information Services, or NIS, and LDAP, which will solve a lot of these problems for you if you have multiple servers in your organization or your research group. NIS is usually pronounced NIS. So if someone talks about NIS, that's the form of network information systems that they're using. Red Hat Unix has a enhanced security system and they talk about the Linux context and it contains additional information such as the Linux user, the role, the type, and the level. You can look in the man pages and the documentation for more information about this. The last entity when considering permissions for files is other. So first we had the user that owns the file, then the group that's associated with this file, and finally others.
Once again, if you have a file, and maybe it's a program that you wrote, you might want to have read and write and execute access to this file. You want your rest of your group possibly to have read and execute permissions. And then you want everybody else on the system just to be able to have execute permissions. So we can set up the files in this in this form. If you do an ls-l, the first column shows you the permissions. So first, there's the file type. Then there are nine characters, which will say either R for read, W for write, X for execute, or a dash, which means the person does not have that permission. After the permissions comes the number of hard links, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Next comes the user that owns the file, then the group, then the size of the file, the date it was created and modified, and finally the name of the file. So in this case we have a directory named public that's owned by root and is associated with the group root. And it was created on April 26th. So that very first character tells you the file type. We said if there's a D there, that means that it's a directory. If there's a dash there, that represents a regular file. For instance, a text file. If there's a lowercase l, it represents a symbolic link and it's similar to a shortcut in Microsoft Windows. We'll talk more about this later in the lecture. If there's a P there, it designates a pipe. After the file type, the next three characters are permissions for the user who owns the file. R is for read, W is for write, X is for execute. This file, the user has read, write, and execute permissions. You can imagine that there are times when you want to make, for instance, a backup of a file and you want to, might want to take away your own write permissions and make the file read only so you can't change it in case you needed to, to revert back to it for some reason. The next three characters are for the group. In this case the group has read and execute permissions. It does not have write permission. You can tell it doesn't have write permission because where the W should be is a dash. The next three characters are the permissions for everybody else on the, com on the system. So in this case we see that this file is owned by Joe and the group is FAA. Joe has read and execute permissions. The group has read and execute permissions. And everyone outside the group has 
read and write permissions. So the owner has read execute, the group has read execute, and everyone else on the system has read write. Now this is just an example. It would rarely happen that you would not want that you would take away read a write permission from yourself and the group and let everybody else write to the file. So here's the summary. The first character is for the file type. The three you'll see most are regular file, which is just a dash, a lowercase d for directory, and a lowercase s for symbolic length. The next three characters are for the owner or user. Once again, this is the user that owns the file. Next comes the group. and finally other. If we wanted to add write permission for the group, we could use a utility called chmod. So that's C-H-M-O-D for change mode. So if we chmod G plus W G stands for group, and plus means add permission, and W means write. If we wanted to remove all permissions for others, we could say chmod O minus RxW and the file name. This would remove all permissions for others they would not be able to write to it, read it, or execute it. Let's say we wanted to add execute permissions for the user or the owner of the file. We could chmod u plus x and the file name. If we wanted to add read permission for everybody, we can say chmod a plus R in the file name and all users will have read permission. Using the R, W, and X can get a little confusing at times. So there's a binary approach that's takes you a minute to learn and understand, but it'll make your life much easier when writing scripts and when managing the system. So this is the idea. If we look at read, write, and execute, our first row, or excuse me, our first column where the execute goes, the execute permission is, we'll say is 2 to the raised to the 0 power. The next column will be 2 raised to the first power. That's where the write permission is. And finally, the next column is 2 squared or 2 raised to the 2 power of 2. And that's where the write permission is given. So 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, and 2 squared is 4. If we add them all up, we get 7. So if I want everyone to have read, write, and execute, or if I want read, write, and execute permissions to all be given, I would just put a 7 in as a uh, input to my chmod utility. So we need a number 
for the user, a number for the group, and a number for other. So for instance, let's say we wanted the user to have read, write, and execute permissions. That's 4 plus 2 plus 1 is 7. Let's say we wanted the group to have write permissions. That's 0 plus 2 plus 0, we get 2. And finally, if we want other to just have execute permissions, that would be 1. So we could do a chamad. 721 file name and that'll give the user read write and execute permissions the group write permissions and everyone else execute permissions so chamad 721 in the file name will set up these permissions Let's do another example. Let's say we want the user to have read, write, and execute. That's 7. We want the group to have read and execute. That's 4 plus 0 plus 1 is 5. And we want everyone else to just have execute. That's 1. So the command line would read chamad 751 and the file name, and then we press enter. Let's say we want everyone to have read, write, and execute privileges. So that's 777. So chamad 777 file name means everybody has read, write, and execute permissions. Jamad 000 file name will mean that no one has permission to do anything. They can't read to it, they can't write to it, and they can't execute to it. Execute it. Okay, so the user who owns the file can grant or deny permissions for himself, the group, and others. The super user, root, has read, write, and execute permission for all files. The super user, root, can also modify the permissions for all files. So for instance, root can come in and remove write permissions for the person who owns the file. It's important to note that if a, unit gra a user grants permission for a file he owns to groups or others, he also has to permit them a path to get to the file. So for example, if you give someone read permission to a file, but the directory the file is in does not have read permission for the group or others that you want to be able to read the file, then they will not be able to read it. So consider this example. We have two users, Joe and Rose. Joe wants to give permission for Rose to read two files. They're named file1.txt and file2.txt. And they're in directory home slash Joe slash sample. The system prompts in the next slides have been changed to be the user's name to help you keep track of the users. On one, on one screen is what Joe sees. On the second screen is what Rose sees. 
Okay, so first, we look at Joe, and he just belongs to one group, FAA. We look at Rose, she belongs to two groups, Rose and FAA. So Joe creates a, a directory sample, and he does a long listing, and we see that we have a directory called sample. Joe has read, write, and execute permissions. The group has read and execute permissions. And everyone else on the computer has read and execute permissions. So let's change the directory sample. And Joe is going to create two files. The first one is file1.txt. If you remember, echo writes things to the screen, but the greater than sign means redirect. So what we're going to do is take whatever was written on the screen and redirect it into file1.txt. So in this case it says echo this is file1 and I'm going to put it in file1.txt. We also have this is file2, and that's dumped into file2.txt. So once again, echo means print this to the screen, but the redirect says take whatever you're going to print to the screen and put it in this file called file2. If we do an ls-l, we see that the owner, Joe, has read and write permissions. And the rest of Joe's group of FAA research members has read permission. And everyone else on the system also has read permission. So let's see what Rose can see. She does an ls-l on slash home slash Joe. And she finds out that she can't get into the into that directory. That slash home that just slash Joe has permission denied. If she tries to do a reading, a listing of slash home slash Joe slash sample, she also gets a permission denied message. So, Joe goes ahead and prints out the directory structure. And what we see is if we look at ls-l slash home slash joe slash sample, we see that the owner has read-write permissions, the group has read permissions, and everyone else in the computer has read permissions. We're going to chamad slash home slash joe and give the group read permissions. So after he's done this, Rose tries ls-l again on home Joe and it says cannot access slash home slash Joe slash sample permission denied. And it prints out some garbage. It's not enough to give the person read permission on a directory. You also have to give them execute permission. So in this case, Joe goes ahead and gives execute permission in the directory. And Rose can do an ls-l. And she can see things. 
and she sees that there is a directory under there that belongs to Joe and has the group FAA associated with it and it's called sample. Now if you look at file 1 and file 2.txt we see file 1 everyone has read permission but on file 2 only Joe has read permission when Rose tries to read these files what happens is that she can read file 1.txt because she had read permission but she cannot read file 2.txt By the way, she can still see that file 2.txt is there. She just can't read it. Sometimes giving people permission to read these directories can get or these files can get a little difficult. So one thing we can do is use the link utility. Links are similar to pointers in C programming or shortcuts in the Windows, Microsoft Windows operating environment. There's two types of links. There's hard link, which is a link to the actual file. And there's a symbolic or soft link that's just another name for the file. So it's a pointer to the file. If you remove a symbolic or a link, you remove only the link. More often than not, when you're using links, you'll be using the symbolic link instead of the hard link. Here's the beginning of the man page for the utility LN, and this makes links between the files. And what we see is if we do an LN, what we first need is the target and then the link name. So the target is the existing file, and the link name is the link is the name of the link. Here's some of the options. So for instance, dash B is like backup, but it does not suggest su accept an argument. Here's some more options. One is dash S for symbolic. Why would I want to create a link to a file? Well, let's say there's a directory with a seriously long path name and you want it to appear in your local directory, maybe even your home directory, and want it to make it look like it's local. So for instance, let's say we have a bin directory and let's say that this bin directory that we need the that we need the executables from is in a path slash user slash local slash graphics slash ncar g slash version 3.4 slash bin. What we can do is create a link, a shortcut, and once again, first goes the existing file or directory. And then goes to the, and then that's just followed with the link name. So for instance, here we have ln dash s, and there's a space between the ls, the ln, and the dash s, and then a space user local graphics ncar g version 3.4 bin, and we want to create a name 
tilta, which is our home directory, slash ncar g slash bin. This is also good for version control. So let's say we're trying out version 3.5, which would be in user local graphics ncar g version 3.5 bin. Then we can change this link to be to 3.5 slash bin. So we can keep the old version and have a link to the new version. Let's take a short little side trip. There's something called an inode, which is an index node. An inode is a data structure found in many Unix and Linux file systems. Each inode stores information about the file system or the file system object. It contains the file, the device node, the socket, the pipe, etc. It does not include data content or file name. So in essence, it's a number, an integer, that represents a file. You can find the inode numbers by using ls-il. And sorry, we lost video for a second. But what will come out are the inodes for the files. So for ex example, there's a file there named install.log and the inode is 8650754. This is a unique number that represents the file. Okay, so we're going to create a couple files. The first one's called file1.txt, the second one's called file2.txt. We'll use the echo and then a string and the string is, this is file1. We're going to redirect it to file1.txt. So the first line on the screen creates a file called file1.txt, which contains the statement, this is file1. In the same manner, we're going to create file2. Just to make sure everything's OK, we'll do a cat file1. and it reads this is file 1. We do a cat file 2 and this reads this is file 2. Okay let's make a copy of that file 1. So we're going to make a copy of file 1.txt and call it file 1c.txt. We're also going to make a hard link and that link is going to be called file2h.txt and it's going to be linked to file2.txt. We're also going to make a symbolic length so ln minus s or excuse me ln dash s file2.txt and the name of the symbolic link is file2s.txt now let's do an ls dash al, um, excuse me, il. So this will tell us the inodes. So we have file 1c.txt, its inode is 619. File 1.txt, its inode is 597. File 2h.txt, its inode is 616. file2s.txt, its inode is 623, and finally, file2.txt has an inode of 616. 
All right, so for a hard link, a hard link is actually another name for a file. So notice that the inode on this hard link, file2h.txt and file2.txt, both have an inode of 616. If I change the copy, file1.c, so I'm going to dump this line into file1.c, I'm sorry, file1c.txt, I have echo, this is a copy of file1. Notice that when I cat file1, it still has the old message in it. And if I cat file 1.c, it has the new message in it. So if I make a copy of a file, not a link, if I change one, the other one doesn't change. It works the other way too. If I change file 1.txt, it will not change file 1c.txt. So this is two different files, they have two different inodes, and changing one doesn't affect the other. Removing one does not affect the other. They're completely independent. For the links, this isn't true. If I change either the original, or the soft link, or the hard link, the other three will also change. Notice also that the soft link is indicated by file2s.txt which points, so dash greater than sign, to file2.txt. Okay, so it's just a pointer to that file. If I change any one of those files, all three change. If I remove the soft link, the other two files stay there. Okay, so if I remove the soft link, the other two files stay. If I remove the hard link, the original file still stays. All right, let's go back to the beginning. We have a file that's called file2.txt. I'm going to make a soft link, which is just a shortcut to the file. And I'm going to call it file2s.txt. I'm also going to make a hard link called file2h.txt. Don't forget the original file goes first and then the new file. If I remove file2h.txt, the soft link and the original file are perfectly okay. Look what happens to the soft link when I remove the original file. So the soft link file2s.txt points to file2.txt. If I remove file2.txt and I try to do an ls-l, the link is still there but it's pointing to a file that's gone. And if I try to look at file2s.txt for instance, using a cat utility, what we see is that it tells us that that file or directory does not exist. So the pointer is still there, but it's pointing to nothing, to a file that's been removed. By the way, the hard link is still there. Okay, 
So when I remove the file, file2.txt, what I actually did was remove one of two names to that file. The symbolic link is now confused because that file isn't there anymore by that name. However, file2h.txt is still there because it's a second name to that file. So when I remove file2.txt, all I'm re doing is removing one of its names. The file's still there. And that file has an inode number 616. Okay, a couple other security issues that we should talk about. If we have an Etsy password file, it almost never actually contains the passwords. Once it did hold the passwords, but what it was was a text file that anybody could read or write to, so you can imagine the complications that were caused. So, what we did was remove the passwords from the password file and encrypt them in a file called Etsy Shadow. So, if we're not using LDAP or NIS, there's an encrypted file that contains the passwords called Etsy Shadow. You can change your own password using the password utility, password and enter, and if you're logged on as root or administrator, you can change the password of other users, so for instance if they forgot their password, that will let you look at how much storage is left in a particular file system. Top Top lets you know what processes are using a lot of CPU time and MPSTAT will do the same thing. Okay, this is probably a good place to stop. Feel free to send me your questions. And we'll see you next time.